All right. Please take your seats. All right. It is my pleasure to welcome here Pavel Yakovlev, who is the director of the computational biology department at BioCAD. So it is our pleasure. Please. Thank you. So hello everyone. Uh, I am Pavel from computational biology department of BioCAD, and some of you may know me as a protein designer, and that is right. My uh, main area of interest is uh, biological therapeutics research, uh, where I and my team are creating some novel methods and tools for uh, rational antibody engineering. And uh, yesterday I've heard uh, some conversations about antibody humanization in a lobby. So if you have uh, some questions about that or just want to talk about it, uh, feel free to find me today. Uh, it will be my pleasure. But today I'm going to talk about some mathematical tricks uh, on uh, small molecule heat generation, not about uh, biologics. And uh, to get you into the context rapidly, uh, let me briefly introduce what BioCAD is today. So BioCAD is an international full cycle biotechnology company with seven branches worldwide. And our main areas are oncology and autoimmune diseases. And we are the number one company at these areas at our homeland. We have uh, 46 products on the market already and more than 60 projects uh, in our pipeline on different stages of development and clinical trials. And most of these projects are multi-specific antibodies. So we have uh, binders to almost all immune checkpoints and most of oncology targets. Uh, most of these molecules are created uh, using uh, some bioinformatics and computational biology approaches that we also use to uh, speed up and support all of our R&D processes. But it wasn't always so. Uh, BioCAD uh, is a very young company, so while most of uh, oncology market players were founded uh, centuries ago, BioCAD was started just in 2001, four years after rituximab, the first anti-cancer monoclonal antibody was launched. So we didn't have both experience and expertise of all of these great companies. Uh, that is why we were able to start our first monoclonal antibody project just in 2012. And by this time, there were several dozens on uh, of antibodies on the market already, and the immune checkpoint revolution has already begun. But what did we have in 2012? It was a couple of very unhappy llamas on the north of St. Petersburg and a female camel in a near Moscow forest that we use for immunization, a high throughput phage display technology, and an old 454 sequencer that raised doubts even when buying. We wanted to use all of this stuff to create a classical antibody research pipeline, immunize animals, uh, uh, find some leads, characterize them, and then produce. To increase our speed, we decided to use lots of automated machines for every research and development step of our process. So our labs became look like more production holes with all of these robots. We really thought that uh, this will speed up us a lot, but we were wrong. Because uh, uh, all of our researchers were buried by piles of data they couldn't deal with. And this was a nice impulse to start a data analysis division at BioCAD uh, that was firstly specialized on uh, data processing like uh, NGS analysis or protein characterization, but then was converted to a computational biology department with uh, three internal branches. Uh, uh, bioinformatics software development, uh, data analysis, and uh, structural biology. This helped us to uh, to solve our our uh, productivity issues and uh, became the company with all the products uh, we have now. And maybe that is why we were brave enough to start our original and novel uh, small molecules branch in 2014. By this time, we didn't have a huge chemical library, no parallel synthesis of thousands and co of compounds. And as you may know, there are some troubles with 
uh, chemical reagents delivery into Russia since 2014. Uh, but uh, no matter what, we started with a couple of HCV projects and then moved to our primary area, oncology. Here we have a number of uh, next-in-class projects with uh, uh, well-characterized targets where we, we are trying to find some novel compounds. And of course, we have a couple of high experimental first-in-class projects too. Uh, we started to use in silica tools a lot, both housemate and external, to um, select some molecules that uh, should be synthesized and characterized in vitro. But uh, here we we faced some problems that uh, all the molecules we, we we are characterizing should be uh, should be drawn by some medical chemist or should be found in some huge uh, random library. But as I tell, told you before, our synthesis is slow and we do not have any medical chemist at BioCAD. So we faced a real problem, where can we find some novel molecules to screen and how to optimize the heats we got. Uh, we, uh, to get started, uh, we decided to uh, generate some combinatorial libraries from little fragments. So these fragments were, uh, were selected by some pharmacophore or uh, docking screening and then attached to each other to make it possible. We downloaded and uh, annotated uh, millions of compounds from different vendors and aggregators. Uh, but uh, the f our first test shows, uh, showed us that uh, the size of our libraries uh, grows exponential by the number of generation while just a little subset uh, of the molecules in our libraries are unique. Uh, to solve this problem, we designed and implemented an algorithm uh, for graph automorphism detection. Uh, we represent each molecular like a planar graph and then search uh, for its symmetries uh, to detect the unique points uh, where we can attach new fragments to. This approach uh, helped us uh, to uh, reduce the needless work on molecule clusterization or duplicate molecules in silico characterization, but uh, not all of these molecules uh, could be synthesized and uh, this is the next problem. Uh, we decided to modify our algorithm and add some reaction rules to it. Uh, as, uh, the rules of uh, building block linkage. Uh, so, uh, as planar graph is morphism is a well-known and solved problem, uh, we can search some structural patterns in our compounds uh, by uh, structural search, and the patterns themselves could be represented li just like uh, smart strings, because uh, it's easy to generate these strings and uh, easy to store them. So for each type of reaction our chemist can do, we created a number of rules uh, to use with our generator, but uh, we don't think that this approach is nice because we have more than thousand rules for each type of the reaction, but it is a suitable temporary solution. The other way is to use a bottom-up approach and synthesize these rules from some basic physics, so quantum mechanics and resonance theory can help us with that. Uh, so uh, these methods can predict us some suitable parameters of our molecule depending on some environment and conditions. And uh, these uh, quantum mechanics based parameters could be useful to uh, separate molecule, molecules that uh, could be synthesized by, by some reaction from the molecules that cannot. If we obtain a big data set uh, with no synthesizability, we can construct a machine learning uh, algorithm that will separate uh, these molecules and generate us some simple rules uh, that would be um, uh, that would be physics-based and not knowledge-based, and uh, this is the approach we, uh, we are using uh, in our generator now. So for now, we can generate novel and synthesizable uh, molecules uh, 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 from the best scored block as, and do it fast. So we have millions of them, uh, so it takes a while to uh, prepare them uh, by conformational search. Uh, predict some admin doc and maybe use some 
free energy estimation methods. But after all of this work, we, we got some best molecules with uh, a suitable uh, uh, parameters. And if we synthesize them, we can find that they have some detectable in vitro activity. Unfortunately, their properties are not good enough to go with these molecules to clinical or even preclinical studies. So we have to optimize them and we still do not have any medical chemist. So how can we do it? Uh, in silico and uh, in vitro analysis uh, helps us to score this molecule by some complex functional uh, that uh, considers both activity and ADMET. Uh, so we wanted to find some best molecules and generate something nearby that will maybe have some more suitable properties. Uh, to perform it, we select the best molecules we have to some corpus and uh, train a recurrent uh, neural network to generate some molecules that uh, looks like uh, the molecules in the corpus, but the different from them. We also add some random compounds to our corpus with unknown properties uh, to increase some diversity of our molecules. Uh, this helps us to find some uh, novel molecules. And uh, if we, uh, we are lucky enough, uh, these molecules even have some better, better properties than the best molecules that we found by our random screening. Uh, and uh, this helps us to do some local optimization like any medical chemist do it. But what if the best molecules uh, lay in some other chemical space, not in the place where we, uh, we have searched uh, by our random uh, library screening. Our local optimization cannot uh, perform su su such a huge step so we will never find these best molecules by, uh, by this method. And uh, the question is, can we do better and can we find these molecules? Medical chemists uh, will tell you that you should uh, work with, uh, some, with some chemotypes and search something uh, nearby uh, the molecules you have, but as I'm standing here, I think that yes, we can, we can, we can do better. And uh, some simple uh, theory can help us to get uh, better optimization of our molecules. So, but this step, we already have some points, the molecules uh, that are characterized in, in silico or in vitro. Uh, and this means that we can create some model that will predict uh, the properties of these molecules. Of course, this model will have um, zero error on the points we already have, because uh, this is our training set, while the, um, the error on all other chemical space could be huge enough. Uh, despite this, we can find the point where our model shows the uh, least value. We uh, let us suppose that the least value of our model is the best point for us and it is optimum for uh, all of our properties, both uh, kinetics, uh, thermodynamics and, um, uh, and ADMET. And uh, as you uh, saw, so this point of our model maybe show us some, some best molecule. But uh, this is just a single model, and of course, this optimum cannot be real. So let us add some, uh, a couple of more models. And uh, what we have now is um, some probability distribution of minimum location uh, uh, of our chemical space. We can continue to add new models, and the more model we, uh, we add, um, uh, the, uh, by the number of models, the uh, probability distribution will change too, but from some number of models, uh, this process will start to converge and uh, we will have some probability distributions that uh, wouldn't change anymore. And uh, that is what we are looking for. So let us suppose that for now we have constructed an infinity number of models. And uh, that means that we have some confidence intervals of our functional values 
for each point of our chemical space and uh, uh, these confident intervals is, uh, are huge enough in unknown places of our chemical space but they are just point at the molecules we already characterized and uh, also we have some continuous uh, distribution of uh, posterior probability of uh, the minimum location of our functional. So let us look to the least value uh, of, uh, of our functional, it will, would be the, the highest probability of our distribution. And again, if we will be lucky enough, we will uh, get some molecule that is better than uh, our current leader. But what we have now, uh, using this point, we can retrain our models and uh, have a, a new probability distribution with a shifted peak. So we can uh, choose the next point uh, and look at it and characterize it by in silico or in vitro assays. And uh, um, uh, as more point we have, as, uh, as sooner we, we will uh, come to some, some optimum and uh, these steps can be large enough because uh, we do not optimize the molecules we already have, but we uh, recompute all the probability distribution on each step uh, of our process. So we can go far enough from our initial leader and probability theory uh, tells us that this process uh, will converge to some minimum, maybe not the global one, but uh, uh, at least a fairly uh, deep local. Uh, this method is called uh, Bayesian optimization and uh, it was introduced in far 1978 but got the second breeze in, at the end of 2000s uh, on the problems of um, neural networks metaparameters optimization where you cannot just perform a grid search uh, in all uh, in the old source space, while the random selection of these parameters gives you some suboptimal solution. So, as uh, Bayesian optimization uh, use functionals, we can optimize both thermodynamics and admit at the same time. We need some homogeneous um, function set, and uh, there is a good one called a Gaussian process that we can use for our models. Uh, the method requires a, a compact set. Uh, we, we will face this problem a little bit later, but for us it means that we should use some, uh, some finite chemical set, uh, space. Uh, it may be uh, huge enough, but uh, not the all chemical space. And at last, uh, our algorithm arguments should be represented as n-dimensional real vectors, and uh, this is a real problem. Because our molecules are not real vectors, they are graphs. And here we, say, uh, we face the next problem. How can we transform our molecular graphs to some uh, n-dimensional real space vectors and back? Uh, so we use uh, neural network autoencoder uh, to train a model uh, that uh, repeats the smile string that uh, uh, we have. Uh, uh, on the input of our model and gives us uh, the same smile string as, as the result. And uh, in the center of this model, we have some vector that represents uh, our molecular graph. And as we have an autoencoder, our smiles uh, representation can be fully encoded to this internal vector and uh, this vector uh, and, the, and the molecule could be restored by this vector without any additional information. But of course we can have lots of different representations uh, of this vector, but we want to use uh, the best one for our needs. So we train one more neural network on this vector to predict some uh, useful parameters like ADMET or Pharmacoforce or docking score to some targets and uh, this helps us to select the best vector that uh, represents uh, the uh, chemical property, uh, properties of uh, our molecules. 
So uh, for now, we obtain an n-dimensional real space vector from our molecule and we can use this vector for our Bayesian optimization. This vector representation has a very great and necessary feature that by changing of uh, some of its components, we, we, uh, we will have some novel molecules. And if we take a couple of points in n-dimensional real space, then all the points on the segment between them will represent some molecules too. And uh, that is what we really need for, uh, for uh, our process. But of course, as you can expect, Bayesian optimization is not a panacea and there are a number of problems, uh, both method-based and domain-based. And uh, first problem is uh, from our graph vector isomorphism. Let us think a bit. We have much more n-dimensional real space vectors than the molecular graphs. So uh, not every point in n-dimensional space represents some molecular. So we have to implement some tricks to find the moleculars nearby. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's really painful. Of course, if you use some uh, machine learning te techniques, you, you have to represent your molecular graph to your models. And we, 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 we have chosen uh, a SMILES representation, but it has uh, it, its problems too. Again, it's much more strings that the strings that represent some molecular graphs. So if, when you use uh, smiles in your generator, you will always have lots of invalid strings that do not represent any molecules and uh, you have to deal with it too. And uh, the last problem is method-based because Bayesian optimization as a mathematical method uh, has uh, lots of our uh, own metaparameters and it is very sensitive to these metaparameters. So you have to optimize them uh, to get the better result. Okay, so some things to take home from, from this talk. Uh, first of all, of course, it's better to have medical candidates than not to have, but uh, if you do not have one, use mass a lot because there are lots of uh, great uh, a great mathematical methods from some adjacent errands that uh, you can use in drug discovery. Uh, and uh, of course, when you use some machine learning techniques you need uh, and work with small molecules, you always need some uh, molecule vector in the mar uh, isomorphism at, and it is a real problem and maybe we should solve it all together because when, when we find some suitable solution, we, we can uh, increase the quality of uh, all the uh, molecular, uh, small molecule research area. Uh, and of course, we, we live in a data-driven world and uh, the processes we are looking at are too complex. So we have to use some machine learning techniques and, uh, and uh, uh, data accumulation and descriptions became uh, much more important than uh, ever before. So, so please collect the data because it can help us and uh, other pharmaceuticals to, to, to create, uh, create novel, uh, novel treatments. At last, I would like to thank uh, the great team of computational biology department who did uh, all the work I presented today. Of course, uh, it couldn't be possible without our biologists and chemists uh, who do all the real work while we are just sitting in front of our computers. And uh, I would uh, like to thank all of you for your attention and I will be happy to answer your question now or during the dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Questions? Yes, thank you for the very interesting talk. I'm just uh, wondering, so you say about representation of chemical molecules as some vectors, so yep. this is what you base your theory on, but how you, do you deal with uh, the flexibility of molecules in uh, the real life? I mean, if you put the molecule into water solution, it's not just a rigid structure. It's flexible, so that's when yep. you will have it. So uh, we represent the molecule formula, not uh, not its structure, because because um, we think that when we work in in um, 
uh, some similar conditions uh, so the same uh, the same molecule or uh, the same mo uh, molecule will have the same structure so we don't represent the structures like vectors we uh, the three dimensional structures we represent just just uh, two dimensional molecules but uh, this is uh, some other problem like polarization in some uh, um, uh, uh, in some conditions and uh, of course we need to represent uh, differently polarized molecules uh, like some similar vectors not the exact similar but the near one and uh, we we do it using our second neural network that predict us some admit characteristics and one of uh, these characteristics is the polarization of our molecule and how uh, it would uh, look like in uh, in different pH levels and something like that yes thank you but just in the continuation of that how do you feel so with the uh, things you know that you miss in your models yep. uh, how far uh, do you think you are at the moment from just random choosing the molecules uh, yep uh, it's a great question because um, yep yep uh, it's a common uh, it's a common problem because uh, you, you you are implementing some complex solution and then you are you are trying to uh, compare it with ju uh, just with random selection and then you found that uh, random selection is even better than your complex algorithm. Yeah, uh, so we started with uh, with some random uh, random libraries uh, and uh, we 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 just uh, created some libraries from random fragments. So we. Uh, we we'll have some material to compare with, and uh, uh, for now our libraries are much less. So we started with seven million compounds library, and now we work with libraries of one hundred, uh, one hundred thousand, so two hundred thousands. But the the quality of the results are the same. So you can uh, significantly reduce your chemical space and uh, significantly reduce all the work you need to do on characterization uh, without any loss of quality. Okay, thank you. I will let some other people to ask the questions. Thank you, Pavel. I just wanted to continue a bit on this yeah. very interesting issue. So. If I understood correctly, you use only uh, the parameters of your graph, namely, uh, well, the length of your, well, the distance between the atoms, the type of atoms, and the type of uh, bonds. Uh, yeah, as a yeah, type of yeah, bonds, bonds yeah. between yeah. them, and based on that, you select in a continuous space yeah. some point that might not have any yeah. real yeah. structure. And then, uh, do you do you use the same approach to predict like um, uh, the other parameters like admet? Yeah. So uh, when we train our model, we are trying to to use some vector representation that will have some uh, physical meaning. So this vector representation uh, ca could be suitable for some admit uh, parameter prediction and uh, that is uh, the key idea of, of our autoencoder. But uh, the real problem is that uh, n-dimensional vector space is continuous while uh, graphs are not continuous and so we have uh, lots of holes and our, our space is sparse. So uh, so we have to deal with it, and uh, this is a, a key, key 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 problem of this uh, of this solution. Uh, did you think about evolutionary algorithm in your model? So you can look at Bayesian optimization like on some evolutional model, because uh, you you. Uh, recompute some probability model using the molecules you already characterized uh, so you do not generate novel molecules but you just get them from some chemical space but the method you do it is uh, very similar to any evolutional methods but uh, I think two years ago we, 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 try, we tried uh, some genetics algorithms on 
uh, compounds research, but uh, the, the key problem is that uh, you cannot control the synthesizability of these molecules. So when when you work with uh, with some reduced chemical space that contains only the molecules your chemists uh, can synthesize. Uh, it's uh, much uh, much more possible uh, that you is you will will have some success on your small molecules research. I have a question from our IT group. You mentioned very high uh, error rate uh, when you are generating molecules. So can you comment in more details about type of errors uh, which you uh, which you meet? So how many of them are invalid bonds? How many of them invalid, uh, let's say, and by the way, do you include stereochemistry modifiers in your smiles? Because smiles are low. Yep, yeah, we use. So how, which are types of these errors? So uh, who is familiar with smiles in this? Okay, okay, it's better that I thought. Uh, so uh, smiles representation is a simple string representation. You can uh, uh, go through your molecule using uh, deep first uh, search algorithm. And uh, how many of you are familiar with DFS algorithm? <laughs> I think these people are the same. <laughs> okay, so you you can go through your molecule and uh, just uh, write all the atoms and the bonds you you saw during your walk, and uh, this would be a smile representation of your molecule. So it is some grammatics, it's string grammatics. How you can um, you can describe your molecule. And the first problem that uh, this grammatics uh, is uh, 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 is very strong, but uh, if you have just a single error in your string, the, it wouldn't represent any molecule, and this is the first problem. The main problem for us was uh, unclosed uh, brackets. <laughs> yep, of course, because uh, uh, any uh, recurrent neural network forgets about brackets, because uh, it cannot look uh, so so deep to our molecule and if our molecule have i think 100 atoms and uh, some some branches uh, inside uh, the the brackets wouldn't be uh, closed uh the other problem is uh, uh the other problem um, uh, is the uh, valence of our atoms because models uh, sometimes uh, gives you some carbon with uh, five bonds or something like that but the main problem are brackets there is more. But brackets are brackets means the cycles. Yeah, so it, not, it means not the cycles, but the branches. Uh, oh yeah, so the branches. So yeah. it means that uh, n today your uh, your neural network cannot. Okay, it, it cannot it create. Can. It can. Just but your your thirty percent. Uh, it's very low rate. No. Uh yep. But uh, so uh, it can. Uh, it can do some brackets, uh, uh, so, so some branches, but these branches shouldn't be uh, deep, very deep. But uh, if uh, if your branch contains some t 10 to 20 heavy atoms, everything will be okay. But when you work with some protein-protein uh, interaction inhibitors uh, that contains uh, 200 atoms or t t 300 atoms, it, it can be very complex for this model. And this is a common problem because uh, there are lots of uh, research from Google on uh, strings, uh, smiles, uh, strings representation, and uh, the error rate is uh, something like 90%. So you have only 10% of correct molecules when you use classical uh, char RNN or some, some models like that. There are further questions. Um, hello. Uh, I have a quite obvious question concerning architecture in your RNN encoder decoder. Um, uh, you have some baseline in your solution which you can compare with. Yep. And so uh, we have some Google models uh, that have very nice papers and we 
we, we were happy to find these papers and uh, we took them, we, we took the architectures from these papers and then we understood that these uh, uh, these models can uh, uh, represent only the molecules that uh, are described in paper and uh, one step to any site and uh, it wouldn't be it will not work uh, but uh, this was uh, our base baseline and uh, we couldn't use uh, that neural networks uh, so we we had to create our own architecture for it okay and by rnn in your uh, yeah. You mean uh, vanilla RNN or uh, with Gates units like LSTM, or it's just simple RNN? So it's uh, LSTM based RNN. Okay, but uh, nice. if you have some some additional questions about architecture, you can find me during the lunch and uh, we that would be nice. Talk okay. about. It. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, let's thank Pavel again. Okay. Now it is lunch break and uh, we'll be back here at half past two. Hello guys, hello guys on Twitch, YouTube, Package, um, good game, uh, thank you for watching us. So now we had a lecture from Pavel Yakovlev from Biocat, biopharmaceutical company, it's a Russian based uh, biopharmaceutical company, uh, the leading one. Uh, I'd say in Russia. And so the lecture was very nice about application of different computational approaches like neural networks and Bayesian interference methods into design of new small molecules which are to be the drugs, uh, for example, let's say cancer uh, or any other uh, important diseases. So thank you for watching us. Uh, the next stream we will have, uh, let me check, so the next stream will be tomorrow and we will have, okay, we will have two streams tomorrow, in fact, we, have, we will have a lecture from uh, Mikhail Pison. He is a CTO of Yandex Health. It's a daughter project of Russian IT giant Yandex. It's a like, you know, it's a it's like a Google just in Russia. And this service, Yandex Health, is dedicated to uh, telemedicine, to application IT, into analysis of uh, basic clinical data, uh, data from wearable devices, and so on. And the next lecture would be. Um, uh, would be presented by Alexander Panchen, and he is a very popular, uh, in Russian at least, uh, uh, speaker about. Uh, he's uh, so he specializes in popular science, but also he is a PhD in biology, in evolutionary biology, and he is a uh, scientist at Institute of uh, Information Translation. Uh, sorry, I do not remember. Uh, in fact. Uh, so, he is a member of one of the Russian institutes of Russian Academy of Science, uh, which specializes uh, on the information, on coding of information. But uh, he will present his uh, popular scientific lecture, uh, Time Traveling Porn and Other Signs of Reproducibility, sorry, Apocalypse. And I think it will be very great. So, to, uh, to not to miss uh, our stream, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, on every platform you see us now, you watch us now, like YouTube, uh, Good Game, Twitch, and of course Pekach. So it would be nice to meet you tomorrow at our lectures. And uh, I want to remind you that all the lectures from our uh, school, or almost all the lectures from our winter school, uh, will, uh, will be deposited on our YouTube channel, also called Future Biotech and you will be able to watch them later and also we have we already have many lectures uh, many uh, many recordings from lectures of top world scientists including Nobel Prize winners on our channel so please feel free to watch to comment and we will get back to you and comment to reply something okay thank you for watching us uh, this is was the translation by Future Biotech live
and uh, my name is Arthur Zalewski. I am a um, director of Future Biotech Life uh, and also a PhD student at Lomonos of Moscow State University at Faculty of Bioengineering and Bioinformatics. And this translation was from <clears throat> Future Biotech Winter uh, retreat 2018 and uh, these uh, let's say kind of a conference or maybe winter school uh, is dedicated uh, to application of IT in biology and medicine and uh, the uh, all the guys you can uh, you were able to see here in the hall they are young scientists students PhD students postdocs in all uh, from all over the Russia from top Russian universities companies and so on so thank you again and goodbye till tomorrow bye bye